Tonight, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, a good old buddy of mine, actually since 1998 when we both were participating in the 1998 Year of the Ocean exhibit in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, Bob at the time was at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and they did the feature film yeah. for, the, uh, for the USA Pavilion. And my center at University of Miami when I was there um, developed a lot of the exhibits that were in the NIH part of the exhibit, which was NIH. Of naval research. Well, let me tell you a little bit about, about Bob's background. Um, in bachelor's of, <coughs> Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in 1966 from MIT, no slog school. Uh, PhD at Columbia University in Organic Chemistry in 1970. Then from 1970 to 72, I didn't know this. He was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at UCAL Berkeley. And in 2000, he received honorary doctorates of science degrees from Long Island University and Northeastern University. Now, I'll also say that um, Bob, for a number of years, was um, associated, how many years with Woods Hole Oceanographic? 34. 34 years, ending with, as the director of, of Woods Hole before he finally moved to, um, to Washington, D.C. And when in Washington, D.C., he became the president of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Now, for those of you that don't know what the Consortium for Ocean, of Ocean Leadership is, or for Ocean Leadership is, um, it is a, a national advocacy group that is sponsored in part by universities in the United States that have marine science programs. <coughs> so for us, you all know what's happening with science budgets in the United States. For us, um, Bob and his team are our principal advocates on the Hill with our Congress people, um, with the various agencies, and then of course with our, our groups as a whole twice a year where we have meetings and meet with the agency folks and as well try to develop strategies. Well, tonight, um, um, Bob's um, topic or his strategy tonight is to talk to you about sea level rise. And the uh, title of his talk is Sea Level Rise, Should I Worry? I live at 14 feet, so I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Kigozi. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, yeah, I'm worried too because I have a house in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. This 17 feet above sea level. And they've just done, redone the floodplain there. And our house is an island, and I keep thinking, I hope that really doesn't happen. So I, I'm really pleased to be here um, for your Planet Ocean Seminar, um, and thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction. I was here six years ago, and a lot has changed on this campus uh, in six years. I knew some things had changed, I didn't realize how much. And, I congratulate Dan and his team and, and what he's actually created here. Uh, this is not easy to do, and, and it, it's very hard to do anywhere. And to do it at a university that is growing, and it was mainly a teaching university, and now moving more into research, uh, is even harder. So you deserve a lot of credit there. Um, I think it's extraordinary. So uh, another reason why it's great to be here is um, uh, it's wonderful to get away from the dysfunction of Washington. <laughs> uh, and, and if it was a different audience, I might be using different words. But um, <laughs> it's really quite extraordinary how bad adults can behave. <laughs> uh, it's extraordinary. And so I've come up with a new plan. Uh, we have a five-year-old granddaughter. So my wife and I are going to have our five-year-old granddaughter come down and we're going to take her up on the hill and have her teach them how to behave. It can't be any worse, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts on how the ocean is affecting our lives now, how it's going to affect them in the future, how it may affect your children's lives, and by looking at this audience, your grandchildren as well. Um, as you know, the ocean is the predominant physical feature on our planet. It covers 71% of it. 
Um, but one of the problems is that people think of the ocean as the beach. And of course it is the beach, part of it is, but a very small part. The average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. That's a lot of water. It's a big feature on the planet. Many years ago, when Senator Ted Kennedy was alive, he asked me, he was a good friend of Woods Hole's, and he said, Bob, what can we really do for you? I said, can you get the planet's name changed to Planet Ocean? <laughs> so, it, cut, it, it provides 95% of the planet's biosphere. It's our principal source of oxygen and fresh water because of evaporation. It's becoming increasingly important from the point of view of, of a food source. And, you know, its health, as you all know, directly relates to each and every one of us in a different personal way, all the time. In other words, the ocean makes and keeps this planet habitable for our species. Now, that's kind of a dramatic statement, but it's really true if you think about it. And I'm going to go through some of that with you uh, today. Now, it, the ocean's role in the climate system is equally influential as it absorbs, it stores, and it transports vast amounts of the Earth's heat, water, and carbon dioxide across the globe. Let me give you a couple of examples. Just the top 10 feet of the ocean holds much more heat than anything else in the atmosphere-ocean coupling. Okay? So you could say that the ocean is climate's flywheel. But in addition, you know, we're affecting it by this, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So we're, we are having a big effect on, on that issue of the heat transport. By the way, there's nothing to say that someday that heat won't come back out of the ocean. Okay? Now, ocean waters are warming, and they're becoming more acidic. Ocean currents are beginning to shift, which is very problematic, because that means that you're really changing the dynamics of the climate of the planet. And sea levels are rising, all of which have significant implications for our economy, our health, the health of the, our oceans, and, and of our human society. So, you think about it, you know, we humans, you know, we've been part of the Earth system for about, about 200,000 years, okay? We're going through a very unusual situation right now. The atmosphere is warming at a faster rate than in the last 400,000 years. Okay? The concentration of carbon dioxide also continues to increase. So an increase in, in carbon, the increase in carbon dioxide and other, and other emissions have driven temperatures up about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit in the last 100 years. That's a report, that just, the new report that just came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It came out last week, the second the secondary report. So it comes out every five years, but there are a lot of sections, okay? Now, you might be saying, well, what's the big deal, 1.4 degrees? You know, I don't care if it's 74 or if it's 75.4. Well, let's put it in some kind of historical perspective, okay? So, since the last ice age, which, which was about 14,000 years ago, it, the Earth's temperature has risen 9 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's see now. It's gone up 9 degrees in 14,000 years, and it's gone up 1.4 degrees in 100 years. That kind of puts it in perspective. The rate of increase is dramatic. Now, the second part of the report that was just released concluded that even with a best-case scenario, and you've got to be careful with predictions, but again, I, I'm, I'm a risk assessor, okay? When 5,000 scientists say something, I tend to listen. Doesn't mean they're all right, but there's 5,000 of them. Um, the best case scenario would result in an increase in global average temperature of 3 degrees Fahrenheit in this, in this century. And the worst case scenario is 6.6 .6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's two thirds, over two thirds of the increase since the last glacial period. We don't want to go there, right? I mean, that's going to be a major problem. So these are the, these are the, this is the bracketing, if you will, 3 to 6.6. .6. Now, let's also try to put this in some kind of perspective. It's been several million years since the Earth saw carbon dioxide levels as high as today. Okay? And, and that's a lot, 400 parts per million. 
Now, if the current trend continues, we easily could reach 600 parts per million, and, and the odds are that's going to happen. We keep moving up by the end of the century or earlier. Now, so what does that mean? Should we worry about that? That would put us at the carbon dioxide level of the age of the dinosaurs 60 million years ago. And it was very warm in the age of the dinosaurs 60 million years ago. Now, the only person I know that's happy with that is my granddaughter, because she said, I can actually see the dinosaurs instead of going to the Smithsonian, which is what she visits us in Washington. But that's pretty dramatic. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist here. I just want to lay out some facts for you and what the predictions are. So what does it mean for the ocean? Well, the surface ocean has warmed one degree Fahrenheit since the mid-70s. Okay? And the predictions are that it will continue to increase. And as I said, that's a lot of heat because the ocean covers 71% of the planet at an average depth of, of two and a half miles. In addition, and this is a really important fact, over a third of the carbon dioxide that enters the atmosphere ends up in the ocean. So does this temperature increase and this carbon dioxide increase in the ocean make a difference? Um, you may be sitting there saying, well, is it going to affect us on the planet? If it's going to do that, how's it going to do it? Where is it going to do it? The planet's not uniform. And when is it going to do it? And so what I want to do tonight after setting that stage is, is to talk with you about this changing ocean and, and what it means as it's getting warmer. How do we adapt to these changes? How do we attempt to adapt to these changes? And is there a way to mitigate and to adapt to the impact that will determine, and again, the future of our society, or the kind of society we will have in the United States, and the kind of society that will exist around the world. Because as I said, different parts of the, of the world are going to get affected differently, and we'll talk about that. So, what are the biggest changes that are occurring in the ocean? And what do I consider the, the biggest threats to our way of life? Especially for people like you who live and enjoy the coast. Well, to me, the biggest threats are first sea level rise influenced by a warming ocean and the changing polar regions, the Arctic and the Antarctic. The second, the extreme weather events, such as hurricanes and superstorms. And third, the changing productivity of the ocean. That's what produces our oxygen. And it causes toxic algal blooms, such as red tides, and dead zones, where there's little or no oxygen for sea life such as the Mississippi Delta, which keeps growing every year, the, the hypoxic zone, and off of the coast of Oregon now, which is kind of unusual, you might say. Now, a fourth threat, of which we're only beginning to understand, is ocean acidification. The addition of carbon dioxide to the ocean and how it changes the productivity of certain marine microorganisms, which we depend, uh, depend on, we depend on for 50% of their oxygen, plus, you're not going to get many oysters either if there's a problem there of them growing. But, but for this presentation, what, what I really want to do is focus on the first two threats. The combination of sea level rise and extreme storms. That, I feel, is what we need to focus on and be concerned about right now. One of the major impacts on our way of life on the coast, because it's seen as a direct threat to property, infrastructure, economy, and I would add public safety. So let's start talking about that. Global average sea level rose by about six and a half inches during the 20th century. Okay? But by the end of the century, the rate of global sea levels rise was double that. Okay? So it was, it was rising at the rate of 12 and a half inches a century. That's what happened in the last half. Um, and that's based on a very good satellite measurements. Now, locally, of course, the level of sea, re the sea level relative to the land, if you will, vary by greater or lesser amounts, depending on the vertical movements of the land mass, ocean currents, you know, the morphology of the coast, etc. In some subsiding coastal areas, relative sea level rose by two feet or more in the last century. And as a matter of fact, it's very interesting, there are areas in Texas that saw sea level and it saw subsidence levels of the land sinking five feet. And, and that's because of extraction of water and oil. 
fossil fuels. So sea level doesn't rise uniformly throughout the oceans. And as I said, it's, it's due to differential warming. It's due to redistribution of ocean waters. It's further complicated by the ability to forecast a future sea level for any given coastal region of the world. That's what makes it difficult. You definitely have to take the changing ocean currents into consideration if you're going to try to understand what's going to happen to your area of sea level. So let's talk about why is the global average sea level rising? Well, it's a result of melting of glaciers and ice caps, the melting of polar ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica, because remember, that water is on land. Okay, it's going into the ocean. The thermal expansion of the warming ocean water. So as the Arctic Ocean ice melts, there's a thermal expansion. Warmer waters take up more room, if you will, than ice. And there's changes in water storage on land. The warmer the atmosphere, the more evaporation of water out of land. Okay? So that means the subsidence of the land. The land sinks. So the contribution to sea level rise, let's talk about some, if we can, some, some data. So the contribution of sea level rise of the, of, to the sea level rise of the melting of polar ice sheets has dramatically increased the last decade and has exceeded the contribution of thermal expansion of ocean waters as they've warmed. So this, this melting of, of Antarctic and Greenland ice, ice on land is really changing things. As a matter of fact, 40% of the Arctic sea ice, has, the volume has shrunk since the early 1980s. Okay, now, that's 35 years ago. That's the size of Europe. Now you might say, how do we know that? Well, this is one of the benefits of, of the end of the Cold Well, I'm not sure the Cold War has ended after the last few weeks. <laughs> At least at the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, our submarines were up there watching Soviet submarines. And they were looking up as well as down. And so the ice morphology of the bottom of the ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean are well documented. And they measure the volume decrease from the bottom. And you can match that with the, with the melting from the top from satellites. And that's where this 40% comes from. You know, that's a big number. That's huge. And current estimates suggest that a global sea level rise of, of 3 to 6 feet during this century is not impossible. But it's probably likely in a number of places. So we'll get into that. Furthermore, sea level is going to continue to rise for centuries even after the greenhouse gas concentrations are stabilized because it's, ir it's an irreversible uh, part of climate change. You know, the half-life of carbon dioxide is a long time. It's tens of years. It's, and whereas methane is a lot shorter. That means if we stop putting any more fossil fuels in the air right now, we're still going to have this, this problem continuing for the next century. Okay? Now, locally, though, sea level can rise as little as a half a foot, six inches, or five feet per century. So it's an order of magnitude depending on where you are. It's this uncertainty regarding sea level rise that, that may not appear to be important in contrast to the average depth of the ocean. But let's talk about that. The ocean is huge, so just adding a few inches to a 5,000 meter water call doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, so it's 15,000 feet. What's the big deal? You're talking about a few inches. Well, when that few inches in that basin gets pushed up in a storm surge and there's only a few feet on the shoreline, you got a problem, a big problem. And remember that Katrina and Superstorm Sandy had surges of 20 to 30 feet. Ladies and gentlemen, that was, the, that was the height of the tsunami that hit Japan. So we're talking about some serious business here. And, and that's happened. Those are facts. That is what has occurred. So uh, I want to I now shift. What does that mean, by the way, to civilization? Well, we'll talk about that. Now, for several hundred years prior to the Industrial Revolution, global sea level rose only slightly. And during this period, and through the mid-20th century, if you think about it, shorelines and wetlands were formed. That's how the Mississippi Delta was formed, until you know, we got really smart and decided to start changing it and building higher levees. Um, 
Communities were established. Infrastructure was built. Infrastructures such as roads, bridges, train tracks, ports, and in a number of cases, nuclear power plants. <laughs> now, you all know the train system along the East Coast and the road system along the East Coast, 95, a lot of not Route 95 is on the coast. So our infrastructure went along the coast. Plus, not to mention all the property and how many people have moved to the coast in the last 50 years and continue to. So sea level rise is, is not only affect the, sh the shoreline erosion and inundate low-lying lands, but it's also going to exacerbate the, the, the risks from storm surge. Okay? A one in a hundred year flooding event would occur annually with just a one and a half foot rise in mean sea level in many areas along the east coast. Okay? So a one and a half, it's 18 inches, what you're going to start to do is really change the effect of storm surge. And as, as I said, you know, some of these storm surges have been, have been huge. Because there's a lot of water that you're adding to the Atlantic Basin. And most of the nation's coastal wetlands will be eliminated or forced landward as sea level rises. The survival will depend on supplies of new sediments, for instance, from rivers like the Mississippi. We're blocking that now. With all this, all this when, the, when the Mississippi starts to flood, right, they open up the, the, uh, the levees and, and they flood in the flood zones. Well, that's where all the sediment goes. It doesn't go down the Mississippi and builds up the delta. In addition, rising sea level is also going to increase the penetration of salinity, higher salinity, into the estuaries. And salt water infiltration into coastal aquifers where a lot of communities get their fresh water. One good example is the San Francisco Bay Delta Sacramento River Basin. The Sacramento River provides a lot of the fresh water for the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, guess what? The salinity intrusion is going up the Sacramento River, and they are very worried about that right now, especially with the severe drought they have. Now, many of our cities are already exposed to the, the threats of sea level rise, and I think you've all read about the devastation from Superstorm Sandy. I want to make sure that I emphasize that. It was not Hurricane Sandy, it was Superstorm Sandy, all right, by the time it reached land. It'd be a, a very, very different scenario with a 12-inch sea level rise. Because all that more water would come surging in. So Miami, let's talk about Miami. So let me ask you a question. What do you think Miami spends most of its money on for electricity? They spend millions of dollars a year to operate the pumps 24-7 to keep Biscayne... Bay out of downtown Miami now, 24 cents. Okay, so they already have a major problem. Never mind any more sea level rise. So let's examine some of the many aspects of sea level rise. As I said, a few inches of sea level rise can translate into a large incursion by the ocean into shallow coastlines. <clears throat> now, sea level rise. It is already costing governments and private landowners billions of dollars as they pump sand, as you well know, onto eroding beaches and they repair the damage from storm surges. For instance, I mean, I, I have some friends that live on Jupiter Island in Florida, and I like the Jupiter Island example because it's about seven miles long, and they pump seven million dollars worth of sand every year. I, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, this is not going to work, you know. It, the average height is three feet. Not going to work. They're going to get one storm, one surge, and it's going to be done. Um, and, and I don't have to tell you how many millions of dollars have been spent along your coastline in sand replenishment. And it's really hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on beach replenishment along the East Coast. And many more to come. So let's just take a moment and talk about the combination of sea level rise and extreme storms. So. The hurricane situation is an interesting one, since I grew up in the Boston area. We may have caught a little accent. I, I hope we did, because I really don't want to be known completely as an inside the Beltway Washingtonian. Uh, I hope not. Um, um, and yes, I am an avid Red Sox fan, 
And yes, I hate the New York Yankees. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There may be Yankee fans in the audience, but I, I'm sorry. That's the way it goes. I grew up going to Fenway Park all the time with a friend's father who would let us in. In those days, they used to play day games. So, yep, I'm a Red Sox fan. And, uh, and you better believe my granddaughter is, too. Uh, so, so I don't have to tell you the problems of living in an area that juts out into the Atlantic. As I said, I lived on Cape Cod, still out house there in Woodsville, and it juts out just like you jut out here. Um, and it's a big problem. I mean, you've had seven hurricanes in the last 20 years, five of them being in that 96 to 99 period, and you saw that you know firsthand the devastation that hurricanes can do. They get their energy from the heat in the ocean. So water temperatures above 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit are really ideal for feeding hurricanes. And I mentioned to you that the ocean is warming. So as the ocean heats, more energy be can be transferred to the atmosphere and more water vapor, I might add, which causes more precipitation problems. So, I, so we don't want to just talk about surge and wind. There's also precipitation problems that can be exacerbated. But you know, the temperature in the ocean is not uniform. Most of you that have boats know that there's a thermocline and the surface waters are warm, and then you get into the deep waters, especially in the wintertime, and the, and the water is, is colder. And you might get overturned in the summer in some areas. Now, along the East Coast, it, it's warmer at the surface in the summer, and the temperature drops with depth, as I said. It and it, but it drops, it depends on where you are. But with rising ocean temperatures, this scenario can change and the deeper waters of the ocean can actually get pretty warm as well. Let's talk about an example. The example is Hurricane Katrina. So recall that it was a Category 1 hurricane when it emerged from southwest Florida and it went over to, to, the, to Mexico and emerged off of the northeast coast of Mexico and it headed northwest to the, into the Gulf of Mexico on, on August 25th, 2005. And this slowly meandering uh, uh, at that time, class one hurricane, uh, moved towards Louisiana and Mississippi. And it strengthened to a category five in just a few days, and building into a historic storm. And that was really unusual for it to build that fast. Now, how did that happen? Well, it happened and it, because it gained the strength from the deeper waters. It turns out at that time, the waters deeper than the surface waters, we got warmer and warmer, the surface water temperature was 86 degrees. And so that translated to deeper, deeper water, deeper warm water. If you think of a hurricane as a big heat sucking machine, okay? And as long as there's heat, guess what? It just keeps operating and gaining strength. If it's just, get, if it's just going to get its heat from the surface waters, it's going to take the heat out, and then it's going to be cooler waters, and it won't gain any more strength. But if there's warmer water deeper, it'll just keep gaining strength, and that's what happened to Katrina. The warm water actually at that time went hundreds of feet deep, where it usually only went down about 70 feet in normal conditions. So that's a lot of stored heat. So we ended up with a monster hurricane, not just in strength, but in size. And, and obviously, enormous devastation. So, that begs the question though, right? Does that mean that as the ocean warms, we're going to have more or stronger hurricanes? Well, the jury is still out, okay? We need more information. However, there is evidence that a warmer ocean does increase the number of stronger hurricanes. But it's not strong evidence. Hurricanes have steadily become stronger over the last 30 years particularly in the last few years. Now this could be due, as I said, to higher surface temperatures providing the fuel for the hurricanes. And as I said earlier, generally you need above 80 degrees temperature, okay, Fahrenheit, for hurricanes to form. And that's a thesis that's being developed by a number of atmospheric scientists. One of the, one of the major proponents is a person, Professor uh, Kerry Manuel at MIT. Now intuitively, you might think that's correct. Hurricanes feed on ocean heat, higher ocean temperatures means more and stronger hurricanes. But it's really not that simple because it's not just ocean heat. There are many meteorological factors that determine whether a hurricane is strong, such as wind shear. You get upper level 
tropospheric winds going in different directions, El Nino events, short-term climatic conditions and, and meteorological conditions, the amount of water transferred to the atmosphere, as well as ocean heat. So they all go into determining the strength of hurricanes. So we still have a way to go with our models. We really can't accurately predict. And the, this effect of, of ocean warming uh, with respect to hurricane frequency and strength. How are we going to do that? Well, if you want models, you need data. And the data comes from the oceans. So what we need is ocean observatories that collect data 24-7. And we then can put that data into the models. We need these ocean observatories to be out. It's not good enough to go out there with a ship once a month because you may miss the major events. And that's why these ocean observatories are so important. So my point is that this type of science in, in observing the ocean is so important for predicting and adapting and adaption models. It, who wants to live in a location that's predict, predicted to be hit by numerous, numerous times over a 20-year time period or a 30-year time period by Category 5 hurricanes? I mean, if you knew that, right, you might rethink where you want to live. And you might say, well, you know, hmm, you know, we really love this house, but, you know, the house is going to go anyway. So maybe we better start thinking about a different place. You can't do that with much assurance without the right models. And right now we don't have the data, okay? Now, this kind of research can also be invaluable not only to you, but invaluable to cities and the United States Navy, okay? Ship-based planners. Why? Because city planners, coastal planners, and military planners need 25 to 50 year horizons because you're talking about huge expenditures of money. You're talking about all kinds of local, state, community, commission, federal jurisdictions. You're talking about politics at the extreme. So it takes a long time. Let me give you an example. The United States Navy is putting millions of dollars into their major base in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Right? Just up the road. And why are they doing that? Because they're getting flooded all the time. Now, the money is not going, though, just for the docks. They're raising the docks. Okay? It's going because they have to completely rethink the transportation system. How do people get to work if the roads are flooded? How's that going to work? And it turns out there are sections of the highways in which you get to Hampton Roads and, and uh, Norfolk that are flooded routinely. So there's this national security issue here. All right? What if you have to get the fleet out because a major hurricane is coming? That's what they do. When hurricanes come, you take the ships to sea. What if you can't get people to take the ships to sea? So this is a huge issue for them. It, it's kind of interesting to me because we always think of the military is one of the most conservative groups in our country. Well, you know what, ladies and gentlemen? They are way out in front on the sea level rise climate change issue, big time. They're also a little worried about the Arctic opening up and national security issues up there, transportation issues up there. There are no ports up there for us. We have a miserable fleet, two broken down icebreakers in the United States, and guess how many the Russians have? A lot. And they're building a lot more. It's a big deal. It was the Russians that decided to put a flag right underneath the North Pole and declare the North Pole as part of Russia. Really? I don't think so. But the Navy is worried about that. So these are broader issues than just the issues that we worry about in this country. So. This is a long time scale decision making process that has huge demographic, cultural, societal, and financial ramifications for both the city, its surroundings, and its inhabitants, not just its businesses. We need more information. Now let's shift back to sea level rise. So between seven and eight million Americans live within a six foot, a six feet of uh, Local high tide, local high tide line, okay? 
seven, eight million. And the risk of being hit by more frequent coastal flooding, as I said, in coming decades, uh, is because of sea level rise, and, it, and it's going to keep increasing. So think about it. If the pace of the rise accelerates as much as expected, coastal flooding at levels that were once exceedingly rare could become an every few years occurrence in the middle of the century. So this is, a, again, the nexus between extreme events, extreme weather events, and sea level rise. Now, let's drill down some more. By far the most vulnerable state is Florida. All right? Roughly half the nation's at-risk population lives near the coast, and, and that porous, low-lying limestone that constitutes much of the state. And by the way, it doesn't do you any good to put up seawalls, because guess what? The water just percolates up. It goes down and percolates up behind the wall. It's limestone. It's porous. And I talked to people down there, I'm going to put this big wall up on my property. I said, well, give me a break. Yeah. On your property, what do you think is going to happen next door? <laughs> and don't you think once the street behind your property is flooded, it's going to get you from behind? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, you know? <laughs> so, but you know, it's not just Florida. Most of the East Coast is also vulnerable because of the shallow, wide continental shelf we have. See, that lets the surge build up, okay? It's barrier islands, which you know only too well, and it's location with respect to ocean currents. Now, talk about North Carolina for a minute. Out of X, part of your system. As you are well aware, a panel of engineers and geologists predicted that sea level would rise 39 inches in North Carolina, about one meter, three feet, by the end of the century. And the panel has been advising North Carolina Coastal Resources Commission since the 1990s. And I was kind of fascinated about it when I heard about this. So I, I sort of dug into it on my own. Now, your General Assembly, as you know, passed a law in 2012 to put a four-year moratorium on any state rules, plans, or policies based on expected changes in sea level. The current historical record is an average of eight inches over the past century. But I want to add that if you look at the last half a century, and you just draw a straight line. Don't do any acceleration. Just draw a straight line from what happened in the last 50 years out to the end of the century. It will be 15 inches, OK? But what the legislature decided to do was take that curve and flatten it out for the, for the rest of the century, OK? Now, I, you know, I can, say, I, can, I can empathize, though, with saying we need more science, all right? But one of the arguments against accepting the 39-inch number, and again, I can empathize, is it would have significant economic and development ramifications. But I've got to tell you, there's a big difference between 8 and 39. And maybe you don't want to just choose 8. Maybe you want to think about risk assessment again and say, OK, you know, we're not going to buy the number 39 right now because we want more information. And I think the more information can come by from a good science estimating plan every five years. Reassess, right? Centuries is still got 84 years to go. So we have a long, all of us have a long time to figure that out, right? So you might want to pick, though, something that's not eight and say, well, what would the ramifications be of, say, 15? What would the ramifications be of 25? And, and just see what they would be and do some model. Now, the t so a, a rise in 39 inches, I could just tell you, that would radically reshape North Carolina's broad, low-lying coastline. It would submerge most of the Outer Banks. It would move shorelines miles inland. And it would threaten an estimated 2,000 square miles with flooding from increased damage from storms. Okay? So that means you want to take it carefully. Now, other coastal states, including Maine, which is one of the most conservative states in the Union, Delaware, Louisiana, really, and California, they've been warned, warned to prepare for three to six feet by 2100. So that's, that's one to two meters, all right? So they are already thinking of what, what are those ramifications. They're not looking at the six-foot mark, okay? That's so big, and, it, and it, it, it's so over the top of the damage that would be done, and you'd have to move so many people. But they're starting to think about, well, what if it goes up, you know, one or two feet? How are we going to manage that? Now, you could argue, though, also, that and that's my position, 
you know, not accepting something closer to 39 inch number could actually even cause more problems down the road than now. So I think you've got to start planning for that. And I guess, you know, the old Midas ad, you know, pay me now or pay me later. Uh, I think we don't want to pay everything later because it will be a heck of a lot more. So you might want to think about paying a little bit now to avoid that cost later. Um, the other thing is, don't you think that market forces through investors and, and, and insurance adjusters aren't already thinking about this? Uh, they're thinking about property development and, and economic calculations to, to reflect the heightened storms. Uh, where I live in Woods Hall, we're 17 feet above sea level and they just redid the floodplain. And we're not in the floodplain, but my neighbor is, okay? Our, our house insurance is about $4,000 a year, and my neighbor's was $4,200. It just went to $17,000. Wow. Just went to $17,000, okay? So that's got nothing to do with legislation, right? The insurance company said, you want insurance with us, you're going to pay. So they're already doing their own thing. So the legislature can say, no, no, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to legislate nature. We're not going to pay attention to it. But I would argue with you that that's not what businesses are in business to make money. And are in business to lose money. And so they're already all along the East Coast doing that. And you've heard these stories in Florida. And I assume they're starting to do it in North Carolina as well. So I would suggest, with respect to North Carolina, that it's, an imp it's imperative to acquire a new 2016 assessment of sea level, sea level rise from the science panel. And I would also suggest to you that it would be good to do it every five years. Sea level rise is here. It's not going away. So the sooner we're able to model it, and we can adapt to it better, and it'll be the better, we'll all be better off for it. Uh, I've run not-for-profits for 20 years now, and my business plan has never been denial and hope. Uh, I, don't, I recommend that's not a very good option. The best science, though, has to inform policy. It's not the best science is policy, but it needs to inform policy. There's a lot more to policy besides science. There's economics, there's, poli there's a lot of things involved. I'm not saying that the science should be the main driver, but it's got to inform it. And the sooner that happens, the best we are, the all of us involved. So now let me, let me, if I could, in finishing up in the next few minutes, uh, I want to I move our telescope and go from North, uh, coastal North Carolina to some other locations. And I mentioned to you earlier that the ocean has been rising slowly and relentlessly since the 19th century, but, but it's not even. So let's look at other areas. The, the, the local rise has been higher in a number of other places uh, because the land is also sinking. And those other places are examples of Louisiana and the Chesapeake Bay. So, uh, you know, one has to be aware that there are several processes that are occurring here. There's rising sea level, okay, but there's also subsidence of land, as I mentioned earlier, and that names two. Now, a great example of subsidence it's Venice, Italy, okay? Where the pumping of fresh water has lowered the mean land level significantly. Venice subsided about five inches in the last 20th century just due to the pumping out of fresh water, natural processes, groundwater extraction. But it also saw another five inch rise due to sea level. So the total effect is 50% more than the global average. It was about 11 inches. Okay. Now, one of the more extreme solutions, now I want to move out beyond Venice and go further. Let's go to the Pacific. So one of the more extreme solutions to sea level rise is to move your whole population. Last year, the leaders of the Kiribati, which are a group of 32 islands located in the central tropic Pacific Ocean, so I want you to remember that, because the next time on Jeopardy, if they say it, you can jump up, and, and your husband's going to really be impressed, because he's going to wonder, how do you know about the Kiribati Islands? Because he'll forget, like I forget. <laughs> um, so what have they done? They've come up with an unusual plan to de deal with the fears of rising sea level. 
because they're worried they're going to they're going to wipe out their whole archipelago. They're going to move the whole populace to the island of Fiji. Many of Kiribati's atolls rise just a few feet above sea level. As a matter of fact, the situation is pretty dire since 1999. At that time, three of the un uninhabited atolls in the nation went underwater. If sea level continues to rise at the conservative projected levels, not, not just taking a linear, linear line that we've, we've seen, it's estimated that before the end of this century, the entire nation will be submerged. So the Kiribati cabinet took the extraordinary uh, event, if you will, of endorsing a plan to buy 6,000 acres on Fiji's main island. And the, the acres can fit Kiribati's entire population of 103,000 people. Okay. So I want to give you a quote, because I think this is really important. And you can almost feel the emotion in the Kiribati's president. He said, quote, this is a last resort. There's no way out of this one. Our people will have to move as the tides have reached our homes and our villages. We don't want 100,000 people from Kiribati coming to Fiji in one go. They need to find employment, not as refugees, but as immigrant people with skills to offer, people who have a place in the community, people who will not be seen as second-class citizens. We need, what we need is the international community to come up with an urgent funding package to deal with that ambition and the need for countries like Kiribati, end quote. So this is a big deal. We're talking about cultural shifts. The effect of sea level rise, it, it's also been felt by other Pacific neighbors, like in Tuvalu, Tokelau, and Samoa. Two years ago, the islands experienced a water shortage so severe that most residents feared that they would soon run out of, out of drinking water. And that was because of the, of the movement of salt water into, into their water systems. Rising seas mixing salt water and fresh water. This is another interesting example. Last year, the former Maldivian president, Mohammed Nasheed, he said he, they were considering the very real possibility of moving their entire nation to Australia, involving the relocation of 350,000 people now, think about that. These are sea-going people. These people fish. That's how they make their living. They're going to move to inner Australia? How's that going to work culturally? Big problems. So there are already examples of sea level rise refugees that have occurred. The, the, the people of the Cataract Islands of Papua New Guinea, uh, they're the first entire community, and they were displaced to the island of Bougainville three years ago. Um, and why? Because that island is predicted to be completely underwater by the end of 2015. Not 15, 15. Their final journey, it represents a loss of their home and their way of life. So just a couple of other brief examples. The Asian Development Bank warned country, countries to prepare for influxes of people fleeing natural disasters. So this is this demographic shift that could occur. As climate change exacerbates, and, and I like the word exacerbate, you don't have to believe in climate change alone, but it's exacerbating the situation. Rising sea level, soil degradation, and seasonal flooding. So natural disasters drove 50 million people from their homes in the Asia-Pacific area in the last three years. The bank said that one-third of Southeast Asia's population lives in at-risk areas, including Indonesia, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam. Six of the ten countries most vulnerable to increasing natural disasters in the Asia-Pacific region are big countries. Bangladesh tops the list, followed by India, okay, Philippines. And interesting enough, Afghanistan, and of course, again, Myanmar. So the Earth system is not uniform, as I said. Some areas are going to be more significantly impacted than others. But you know, think about it. The Asia-Pacific region depends heavily on monsoon rains. So as climate changes, the water supply changes, they're going to bear the brunt of changing rainfall patterns, greater monsoon variability, sea level rise, floods, and more intense tropical cyclones. Its population is at risk. 
Well, you know, how many people are talking about? Well, think about the coastal regions. And there was a great poster, by the way, by one of the students in the library about the vulnerability of uh, today when we, when we went through the library, uh, one of the undergraduate, about the vulnerability of Bangladesh, which is a delta, okay? So the population density is high. So we're not talking about just moving people. We're talking about moving cultures and the problems that occur with migration. So I want to suggest to you that on a Southeast Asian scale, which is 50%, more than 50% of the planet, okay, this could cause significant disruption to the geopolitical status quo. Where are those people going to go? And you know, that's how war started. That's how war started. So this is a big issue. And I think the Asian Pacific issue is a ticking time bomb with respect to that. The situation comes with unique human rights, economic, social challenges that have to be dealt with. So, this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've, I've impressed upon you that there's a pressing need for greater certainty on sea level projections and so we can guide, if you will, managing appropriate coastal development and formulate effective adaption plans. So that's manage appropriate coastal development and formulate effective adaption plans. I don't want to be an alarmist. I want to be a, I want to be a realist. We, we've got to deal with the situation. The economic and social stakes are, are they're really enormous. Extensive areas including South Florida, coastal Louisiana, San Francisco Bay Delta area, much of eastern North Carolina is going to be inundated by a three-foot rise in sea level. The Gulf Coast alone would lose 2,400 miles of major roadway, 246 miles of freight, of freight rail lines, and a risk of, of permanent land sea level rise and land subsidence with, with relative sea level rise of three feet. So I, I hope the presentations have kind of given you some examples, if you will, starting with locally and moving out globally, of, of how important it is that we do this ocean research and observing systems so that we, it's going to have a major impact on our lives so we have better prediction systems. And it's so important to predict accurately for the events that we're going to really impact all of us, and our children and our grandchildren, in the, in the coming years. And the time is really to act now. We need the data. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? In. You know, that's a really good question. Um, the, uh, what, there, there was a plan, I mean, several plans with respect to Superstorm Sandy. And there are a lot of, those of you that know the New Jersey coastline know that there are a lot of homes on the New Jersey coastline that have been there for a long time. Let's face it, it's a culture. And, and one of the plans is to tear everything down and make it a, a national park, if you will, much like Nauset National Park in, in, on Cape Cod, in the outer part of Cape Cod, and build those homes further inland. And so uh, there's actually been, and, and there are companies, you know, that do this recycling, which is really quite extraordinary. But you've got to come in, and the whole community has to agree. And there are recycling processes that are used to really make, make a big difference. But again, the whole community has to agree. It can't be house by house. And, you know, that's a problem because it's, it's a cultural problem, you know. And, and just, you know, it was really interesting to talk. There were a lot of interviews. And I was down in, in, after Katrina and, and ended up talking with a lot of people on the coast because we were talking about how do we redo the labs? Do we redo them? Mississippi wanted to know which labs do we redo, which labs don't we redo? And I talked to a lot of people down there and said, well, you know, you know, we survived Camille. But this is different. And we're going to move back. And what did it, sadly, is death. It was someone they knew that died. You know, we can always rebuild. But what really touches people's hearts, obviously, is someone that they knew, some friend, some relative. And it's sort of the the red line, 
and you say, you know, I'm, that, that, that's it. I'm not going to lose my family over this. And I, I'm afraid that, that we think that way as humans. Uh, but, but, you know, Dan, a lot, of, a lot of communities have not thought about that. I mean, they're, they're worried about, you know, the trains go all along the East Coast, <laughs> right? They're right on the coast. Connecticut, they're right on the coast. You can see the ocean most of the way. And the reason why you can see it is because the, the train is so slow. The Excel, <laughs> the Excel Express, excuse me, uh, from Boston to New York. Really? Yes? Something that's not been uh, considered or at least ex expressed is ethnicity and religion. Because we're having major upheavals now between Christianity and other religions. And when you start moving hundreds right. of thousands of people yep. who have had a particular way of life and have believed yep. a particular philosophy for maybe millennia, yep. and they are asked to now move in and integrate with people that feel entirely different, this is going to cause a different kind of social upheaval. I'm really glad you brought that up. And of course, history is rife with it, right? I mean, look at Europe right now. They are having a heck of a time trying to deal with the Muslim problem. They are hiring all these people in, because a lot of, of, of people in certain European countries don't want to do those jobs. On the other hand, well, how do they adapt to this? And of course, one of the oldest ones is England, Ireland, and Scotland. We're still, we're still dealing with those issues. <laughs> so, so you're absolutely correct. The cultural issues are huge. And you know, if you look back over history, some of the biggest climate changes that occurred caused huge shifts. You know, the, the potato famine in, in Ireland was caused by an abrupt climate change issue. Okay? The temperature went down, and, and a fungus came in and destroyed the potato. And, and that's what happened. So guess what happened? The Irish, all the Irish came to the United States. And, and if, you think of, if you think about it, how come they call Iceland, Iceland? Why don't they call it Greenland? And how come they call Greenland, Greenland, why do they call it Iceland? Well, because when they were discovered, it, they were, Iceland was ice, and Greenland was green. And that's what the Norse called it, the Vikings called it. So these big climate shifts have caused these huge migrations. And droughts, and you know, an example in this country is the Anasazi Indians in the Southwest. People couldn't figure out why they got wiped out. How what happened? Droughts, agriculture gone, Mesopotamia gone, and so this this is something that we're being we're, we're beginning to face now. And, and I would add something: if you think about it, the Earth's four and a half billion years old. We've been around for two hundred thousand years. I didn't mean all of you, but two hundred thousand years. Okay, but but you know, humans have been around two hundred thousand years. But civilization has thrived in the last thousand years. Why? Because the Earth was behaving itself. It was behaving itself with respect to volcanoes, earthquakes, and climate. That doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. And so just thinking in a short term is not a good idea. When you start to see indicators, maybe you want to start thinking about a changing Earth and start planning for that. You don't want to get extreme about it, but you don't want to deny it. You want to start thinking about it. I'm really glad you brought that up, because that's a very good point. Yes? Uh, you mentioned something, and I've heard other things uh, recently about changes in the currents. Yeah. Can you talk about sure. that a little bit? Sure, sure. So, so it, 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 the, 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 there's something called the, the, the conveyor belt in the, in the ocean, all right? And the, the climates, because of the way the climate systems are, uh, it starts in the North Atlantic uh, between Iceland and Greenland. And that water is cold and salty, and so it sinks. It goes down about 3,000 feet. It goes underneath the Gulf Stream. Okay? And it goes down the east coast of the United States. It goes down the east coast of, of South America. goes into the Pacific, and then winds its way through the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. comes back into the Atlantic and then it's surface warm water then, okay? And it ends up turning into eventually our Gulf Stream. So that's the nick. 
the Gulf Stream comes up the east coast of the United States, right? It's a surface current, goes around the eel, loses its heat, okay, becomes, and, and, and it's water, so it becomes salty and cold, goes around Greenland and Iceland, six. So, so that's the conveyor belt, okay? Now, in the past, that conveyor belt has been interrupted by big influxes of, of warm, fresh water, of fresh water, excuse me, coming in from the melting Arctic, okay? Now, if you think about it, if you have fresh water coming in, it, it's not salty anymore, it can't sink. So it's like the plumbing in your house. It backs up the whole system. So the Gulf Stream then can't, doesn't go over to England, but it goes down towards Africa. And guess what? You go into a mini ice age. So, because the warm water is not in England. I mean, think about it. England is at the same latitude as Alberta. Yeah. So how come England's warm? It's the Gulf Stream. Okay? And, and, and in southern England and, and Cornwall, there are palm trees. Well, I can tell you there are no palm trees in Alberta. Uh, and, and so that's because of the Gulf Stream. And that gets backed up, okay? So that, that warm water, then the warm uh, surface water can't get over to England and then go up in, into the Arctic and go between Iceland and Greenland because the water from there is not moving south. So the whole system backs up, all right? And that has happened many times in, during interglacial periods. And that was what was called the mini ice ages, okay? Now let me give you an example. For those of you that know, know about Bruegel, the artist, if you look at his, the Dutch artist, if you look at his paintings, a lot of his paintings were not only ice skaters uh, in Holland, they were skating on ice in the Thames every year, and in southern England, okay? The painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, you look carefully, big chunks of ice, okay? That was a, a, was a mini ice age, if you will. And there were several, that was one of the minor ones, and there were several that have occurred in the last 14,000 years. So that's, that's what happens when you get too much fresh water going into the system. Now, what's already beginning to happen is there's early indications that the fresh water that's going in from, coming from the Arctic and from the glaciers and the melting of the Arctic ice sheets because, it, because what happens is the brine has already been pushed out and so when the Arctic ice melts it's more fresh water going in, okay? But most of the issue is coming from fresh water from, from Greenland, all right, and Canada. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So I think you can... Give me a more? Yeah, yeah. I, and I have it on my desk in my office. Okay, well, we have something to go along with this. This is a, a slide of the Urban Ocean Public Policy Forum right. that Ocean Leadership did just uh, last month. Last month, that's right. Well, Bob, here is the artist's depiction of that particular... Oh, wow! <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Oh, that's just lovely. Oh, wow. I'm really taken aback. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm going to put a little... Right? Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll just put a little... <laughs> that's, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Let's all go out and uh, share a reception with our... Uh, Thanks a lot.